Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Now, the Cabinet are going on yet another away day at Chequers to try and thrash out a plan on Brexit. One place that's desperate for more clarity is Britain's busiest port, Dover, handling £119 billion worth of trade. So, I went there to find out how those Brexit preparations are going or not going. So, let's have a look. The port of Dover, the English mainland's closest point to continental Europe. The town is a Brexit stronghold, with a 15,000 majority voting to leave the EU in 2016. It's been another turbulent week in the seemingly never-ending skirmishes with Brussels. So, what do they make of the progress, or lack of it, here in Dover? How happy are you with how Brexit's going? Yeah, good. They're actually starting to do something, which is good. Um, and um, I just hope it hurries up so we can get out as soon as possible. Is it taking longer than you thought it would? Yes, it is, really. People in the street thought about it, voted against it, wanted to come out, and I think, generally, we thought we were going to come out straight away. I don't think we realised that it was going to cost us all this money and take all this time, because all the prices are going up now, up and up and up and up. So, and yeah. why do you think it is taking longer than you thought? Because the politicians are stalling or because it's more complicated than no, you thought? I think it's complicated. I think it's more complicated. But I don't think the politicians are getting their heads together and they don't seem to be able to agree on anything. How do you think Brexit is going to go? It's not going to go nice. It's not going to go down good. Because then people are going to be more in need because you'll be stuck here, you can't go anywhere else to get a job. You know, place closing down, everything is closing down. It, it, these are um, closed stores, a lot of them closing down, a lot of jobs going. Where these people going to get jobs? So you're worried people are going to be poorer because of Brexit? Exactly, people are going to be poorer. One person who is extremely concerned about the impact of Brexit is a head teacher of this independent school. We have 130 borders, and of those borders, they come from around 15 different countries around the world, of which the largest proportion come actually from Europe itself. And how do you think the government's been handling Brexit? Not terribly well. And why do you say that? Because of the confusion, because of the lack of planning? Utter confusion, lack of planning, lack of consistent communication. I think the key thing to this is communication. It's clear the government did not expect this result. And therefore, as a result of that, people like me and other leaders of different businesses and different commerce haven't been given the guidance that's been necessary. And in the end as well, Dover has been seen as a place which is the excuse. Everyone says, this, what's going to happen to Dover? This is going to be a problem to Dover. And it gives us bad publicity. What happens in Dover is, of course, more than just a local story. The port currently handles nearly 17% of Britain's entire trade in goods, worth an estimated £122 billion last year. And the people in charge of making sure everything runs smoothly are not happy. Well, of course, we still don't have um, the certainty that we really need to start planning properly um, to, uh, to know what uh, the eventual outcome will be and to know how we're going to keep the traffic moving through day, which, of course, is, is critical to a port such as this. Uh, what do you need from the government, then? Uh, we, we, what we need is uh, government to give clarity on uh, the customs arrangement um, that we'll have um, post-Brexit uh, so that we can actually start to develop a system uh, that will deal with those arrangements. At the moment, I'm right in saying, aren't I, that only 2% of trucks passing through Dover are actually subject to British customs checks. I mean, that's going to completely transform when Britain leaves the EU. No, absolutely, yes. So o overnight, 100% of our freight traffic becomes non-EU. So 2% to 100%? To 100%, exactly. Um, so uh, at the moment, um, EU freight uh, is, is processed in around two minutes per lorry. Uh, we're handling up to 10,000 lorries a day, which is 180 kilometres of freight. Uh, so overnight, uh, we're going to uh, a situation where that 100% of non-EU goods, which currently can take anywhere from 20 minutes to several hours to process, that all has to somehow be brought back down to that two minute, that key two minute time. How often are you speaking to ministers? Are they communicating with you effectively about preparations? We're, we're, we're meeting regularly, both with ministers and senior officials uh, across government. Um, but at the moment, I think until we've got uh, more clarity through, through the negotiation process, it's very difficult to, um, it's difficult to get the system um, that, we, uh, that we'll need.
In an area where nearly two-thirds of people voted to leave the EU, I was actually expecting to hear more consistency in people's views on Brexit. What we found was the full spectrum of opinion on how things are going. But the one thing that does unite people here in Dover is that they want clarity and they want it quickly. Hello again. Well, watching that uh, with us here was the former, former Conservative Party chairman, uh, Grant Shapps, who joins us now. Um, hello, thanks Morning. for coming into Thank the you. studio. Thanks. What really struck me about Dover was the number of very reasonable, pragmatic people saying, look, we can deal with Brexit, but we need to know what we're planning for. We need yeah. some clarity. And that yeah. clarity just doesn't seem to be happening. I think that that's obviously true, isn't it? I mean, you, you, if you are a business, and I, I just met with the, the employers in my constituency on Thursday evening, if you're a business, you just actually tell us what we're supposed to be doing. The thing about businesses is you could put a boulder up in front of them. They'll find a way around it or through it or underneath or over it. But they just need to know what that boulder looks like. So we need to have clarity on what Brexit's going to look Why like. Why aren't we having that clarity? It's, frankly, because it's a blimmin' complicated thing to, to do. And, you know, um, after thinking it through a lot, I voted remain narrowly. My heart wanted to leave, but my head was remain. Because I always thought this is going to be unbelievably complex to disentangle ourselves from 45 years of, of being in the EU. And so it is. But that doesn't mean that we, we can't do it, and I think it can be successful, but we do have to decide on some of these fundamentals and, you know, tell us and tell the country, um, Parliament, government, uh, and tell business what we're going to do. Yeah, of course it's complicated. No-one would disagree with the fact that leaving the EU is complicated. Mm. But at the same time, in one of the kind of big challenges of your generation of politicians, it feels as though the Conservative Party is effectively in turmoil. I mean... What's happening? Is it a leadership issue? Well, look, I don't think it's just the Conservative Party that struggles over this. Well, you yeah, but the, you're the government, you know, though, aren't you? It's that's, your that's, job that's, to sort out Brexit. That, that, that's true. But let's just look at it as it really is. The country, right, is completely split on this. So if you want a, a party that's representative of the country, here's one argument. You know, the Conservative Party split on it, the Labour Party split on it. Uh, actually, most families, you know, disagree. Um, I know within my family, it's, a, it's a, a heated debate often to discuss Brexit. People are not in agreement um, on this. Um, and so you can't expect political parties to necessarily be in agreement. Um, but that doesn't mean that there isn't a solution. Uh, and I think that there, that, that there are things that can be done um, to make sure that when we are out of Europe, we're still able to trade. Um, and I think we just have to look at it like this. There are 500 million people in the EU, right, of which Britain's a, a component part of that. But there are 7 billion people in the world at large. And we have to reorientate ourselves to think about that wider 7 billion market and get the best possible deal, meanwhile, with Europe. You're saying, of course, that people are split on Brexit. Um, do you think Theresa May should perhaps just you know, forget the kind of squabbling cabinet ministers and just make some decisions? I think, actually, what's really interesting is whenever Theresa May's made a speech, like the Florence speech or one of those big set pieces, um, people have actually afterwards said, oh, yeah, that's, that's, that's OK, we can go along with that. And whether they're Brexiteers or Remainers, They've kind of felt that they could get in behind it. And the lesson is simple, actually. When she does make decisions, people do tend to feel that at least there's a sense of direction. So, yeah, more, more of that would definitely be helpful. It's, it's interesting, because your tone seems to have shifted since last year, when you famously, of course, uh, launched a, a bit of a coup against Theresa May. It didn't really work, um, um, to put it uh, kindly. So, have you, have you changed your mind on well, that? First of all, a bunch of colleagues wanted to speak to mm. the Prime Minister because things weren't exactly going right. We'd had a botched election, we had a rather uninspiring conference. Um, by the autumn, people were pretty fed up. Um, but actually, the reality is that time moves on, changes have been made. So, we've got now, I think, you know, a, a party organisation which is a, a lot better under Brandon Lewis. We've got changes made in in Downing Street, you know, better, a better setup, and, and so actually, um, I think you know, progress is and has been made. Is it a lack um, of alternatives as well? Well, the, there are all these factors, and you've got, you know, a, a, as we we're discussing, a deep indecision about which direction we should take on things like Brexit. So There's not an obvious alternative, but actually, as we were just saying, when Theresa May takes a decision, people actually go, ah, oh, okay, well, I may not agree with all of that, but you know what? Um, the decision's been made, I'm prepared to follow. I think where the problem comes when things are allowed to float and drift and decisions aren't made, uh, and that's when you tend to get to these kind of heated up moments. If you take this week, for example, we've got the bill coming back to Parliament. This is the famous Brexit bill that's been in the Lords. 15 changes have been made. 
I don't personally see a problem with having one or two days, in fact, it's two days debate on this. And actually, I hope voting it back just as it was before, because we've already, as a parliament, gone through line by line by line and agreed all this stuff. So why shouldn't we just vote it back through again? A couple of amendments come back from the Lords, but basically vote it through again. I think that's what will happen. And it's a good example of where a decision is made bring it back to the House, let the House decide, and let's move on. So what would you say to your colleagues who would disagree with that? They think that actually this is something that is too important to just move on, to just you know, vote in a way that they don't believe? Well, look, first of all, we had eight days of detailed line-by-line -line debate on, on every single one of these aspects that's, that's been turned over by the House of Lords. Secondly, actually, when I'm speaking to colleagues, and you saw this morning, and people on different sides of the debates, a, 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 a Brexiteer and Ian Duncan Smith, Remainers coming together and actually agreeing that we should just get this bit of the stage through. You're talking right at the beginning about those businesses in Dover who want to have the certainty. Part of that certainty can be provided by Parliament getting on and providing it. And actually that, of course, requires you know, the Prime Minister and the government to be bringing this stuff back to the, the, the House of Commons to decide on. Uh, and then that actually does provide the certainty that people need. Uh, and just finally, before um, you leave us, do you think Theresa May will lead us into the next general election, lead the Conservative Party into the next general election? I think election? the interesting thing is this. You know, six months ago, a year ago, people were saying, after that failed election, because um, she's only got till next March when we actually leave. I don't think many people now are saying she's going to leave in March because you've got then a negotiation period till the end of 2020, possibly 2021, we learned this week. I think it's perfectly conceivable now. Likely? That, no, but conceivable that she leads us into the next election. And I think potentially even wins that election. So I think it is possible. Um, but we do need to have kind of more decisions made, less waiting around for things, get things out in front of Parliament. Not impossible, maybe 30, 40%. 30, 40%. Go That's on, it. chaps, thank you uh, very much. But the least surprising news of the morning is perhaps the revelation that Theresa May has never watched the ITV hit show Love Island. That's what she told journalists travelling with her to the G7. But perhaps more surprisingly, the contestants on Love Island are fans of Brexit. Well, sort of. We cast Ellie Price away on her very own island to find out just what it is that's going on. Previously on The Real Love Island. What do you think about Brexit? What, what's that? Like, I well, we're leaving the European Union. I don't, I, I seriously don't have so a So, like, if you, so it's to, it was to leave the EU, so we wouldn't um, be part of EU, Europe. Yeah, which would yeah, mean, yeah, like, yeah. welfare and, like, things we trade with would be cut down. So does that mean we won't have any trees? No. Trees? Uh, trees? Oh. No. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's got nothing to do with it, babe. That's <laughs> weather. <laughs> And it is pretty confusing. People threatening to walk out, meltdowns, and of course, plenty of bants. This is Love Brexit Island. There's a newbie in town. Hi Henry, you're from the Times, right? We can totes talk about the government's plan for a backstop customs arrangement if there isn't an EU deal in place in time. Oh my God, there's been so much drama between David and Theresa this week. People thought they were going to have to recouple. Like, what was David kicking off about though? Basically, he thought she wanted it to go on forever and ever. But in the end, she told him what he wanted to hear? Yeah, she put a date in there at the end of 2021 when it's meant to run out, but actually, that date doesn't actually mean anything legally. So kind of they both won? Yeah, that's what David's telling his people, that's what Theresa's telling her people. And in 2021, Theresa May probably won't be Prime Minister, David Davis probably won't be Brexit Secretary, and it's for other people to decide. Oh my God, I got a text from Michelle. Barnier? Yeah, he says the backstop can only apply to Northern Ireland. Hashtag backstop means backstop. The next big thing on Love Brexit Island, voting in the Commons. The Brexit withdrawal bill is coming back from the Lords. MPs will have to work out what to do with like 15 amendments peers want them to chat about. But the biggie has been avoided because Labour says it won't back the one on keeping the UK in the single market through membership of the EEA. So they're probably going to have a massive bust up on what, two or three issues? I'm thinking customs union and the meaningful vote on the final deal. Yeah, there's 12 or 13 Tory MPs who just disagree with Theresa May on Brexit in general and they might join Labour and rebel on some of these things. The government's less worried about the customs one. Of course they don't want to lose, defeats are embarrassing, but they don't actually think the amendment would force them to change their position on the customs union. Shut the front door, I've had a text. Oh, it's from the government, they've come up with some concessions. 
It says it won't give MPs a final say on what happens if they vote down a Brexit deal, but it will come back within 28 days to say what it would do next. Hashtag, please don't defeat me. Do you think that's enough? No, that still means that the default option would be leaving the EU without a deal and loads of Tory MPs don't want that. So you know Anne-Marie? Yeah, everyone knows she loves Brexit. Yeah, she says it's all about give and take. The Prime Minister is incredibly resilient. She's calm, she's listening to everybody, but she continually drives forward quite rightly what it is, which is we're going to get out, we're going to get there. The detail will change, everybody can live with a bit of compromise, but we have to be out so that we are free to determine our own future. So Chucker... Yeah, he'd literally kick Brexit out of bed. Well, he reckons there's more trouble ahead. We've got the trade and the customs bills to come, which is less about the kind of rules and the practical, practical framework, you know, technical bits of the legislation is about the principle of our trading relationship, both of those bills. So this is really important, but the main action could be on both of those bills, which we're told will come in July, 100%. Next on Love Brexit Island, Theresa goes to see her backbench MPs to smooth things over at a special meeting on Monday. And the big votes on Tuesday and Wednesday. Who and what will get dumped from Love Brexit Island? That was Ellie having a bit of fun on Love Brexit Island. And as she said, Theresa May is due to meet her MPs tomorrow to try and persuade them not to rebel in the Commons. And she's been given a bit of a helping hand this morning from the former Home Secretary, Amber Rudd. Now, she's known to be on the Remain side of things, and she uses a joint article with Ian Duncan Smith to call on every Conservative MP to march in lockstep with the Prime Minister, or they imply, risk losing power. Well, the former Cabinet Minister, Ken Clark's in Nottingham, and so far he has not been marching in lockstep with the Prime Minister on Europe. Uh, good morning to you, Mr Clark. Are you prepared to uh, do as Amber Rudd is urging and vote with the government this week? Uh, I'm an admirer of Andrew, uh, uh, Amber Rudd and I agree with her political objectives, but they're quite wrong on the tactics. Uh, I think that the Cabinet Brexiteers behave quite disgracefully last week. They vetoed every compromise that the majority of the cabinet and the prime minister would have made. Uh, I agree we've got to back the prime minister, but kicking the can down the road for another month is hopeless. When we get to the customs and trade bill, exactly the same thing will happen again. And when we get to a final negotiated deal with the European Union, then we'll be in a crisis if they behave in exactly the same way and just insist on vetoing it all. What we need to do is to rescue the Prime Minister from this terrible treatment she's getting. Well, from exactly. Key After such a cabinet. terrible week that she's had, what the warning from Amber Rudd and Ian Duncan Smith is if she is defeated this week, that you risk damaging the government to the point where you could even lose it. They say, they say you risk losing the precious chance to implement your policies. I think so. that's nonsense. Uh, nobody in the House of Commons wants uh, a general election. Uh, most Labour MPs are as terrified of the idea of a Corbyn government as I am. They want to get rid of Corbyn first. And anyway, uh, I don't think the public would elect Corbyn, so nobody's going to an election. We now have a fixed Parliament uh, Act, which makes it clear uh, you don't well, have an election, an election if you lose year. a vote. Sorry? That didn't stop us having an election last well, year. Well, that was called by the Prime Minister. I don't think she would call one at the moment. And if the Brexiteers were so perverse as to try to call one, uh, I don't think they get one. They've got to get a large majority in Parliament to vote for having an election. The general public, people watching this programme, would be furious if we insisted on having another general election. Next week, we can actually give Parliament the opportunity of rescuing Theresa from all this and begin to use the parliamentary majority in favour of a softer, sensible Brexit, leaving the European Union, but actually doing grown-up things in the modern globalised economy, look after jobs and investment. The, the, OK, so under, you're, under, you're under, urging your colleagues to vote... Underneath all these uh, leaks from Boris Johnson and briefings by David Davis, we're actually talking about the well-being of our children and grandchildren. Next Tuesday, a couple of days' time, Parliament has the chance of putting Parliament in control with a majority that will help the Prime Minister get through this summit and start the big negotiations, which, because of all this nonsense, we haven't started negotiating anything serious yet with 27 other 
countries. And now, so it's clear governments. how you're intending to vote next week. How many of your colleagues do you think will come with you? Or will they be swayed by this appeal from Anne Rudd today to hold fire now because there are other opportunities coming up with the trade bill in a few weeks' time? I think there'll be a lot of discussions, even tomorrow, uh, as the people who want to back the, and, uh, the Theresa and wish to rescue her from this appalling behaviour uh, by some of her colleagues who will have to make their own minds up what they do after Tuesday if we win. There will be discussion about how many of us are going to do it. But certainly uh, I uh, will be voting for the amendments on giving Parliament control when we get to the final deal, that's the most important at all. The amendments on a single market, which doesn't tie her to a particular solution, but stops all this talk about no deal, that uh, should go in. Uh, and the third one, which slips my mind for the moment. Well, that's in the on the customs union, turmoil. and that's an interesting one because it's. Actually, it's not the single market customs union. Well, it's, a, it's, it's pretty weak that amendment. All it does is require well, the government a, to report on its attempts to obtain a customs union arrangement. It doesn't require them to sign up to any kind of but, but customs union a, arrangement. What's is, the point of that? It is a clear signal. Uh, that, uh, that, that, that a customs arrangement is what we, a customs deal is what we want, a customs union is what we want. I mean, the, it's not the customs union, it doesn't have to be the present one, that's to be negotiated with 27 other governments and they've got to get the approval of their parliaments. A customs union actually steers things in a direction which uh, uh, Boris and David Davis and these people are trying to veto. The, the, the Brexiteers are proceeding with Donald Trump type methods of, of appearing to agree one moment, then confronting uh, and vetoing any progress. So do you the think the single market uh, amendment is very important? The other one, of course, is the Irish one. We the must keep to the Good Friday Agreement must have an open border. It would be shameful to vote that down. Uh, and uh, that has a big effect, actually, on the what's open to us by way of a customs uh, union. You're very critical of your Brexiteer colleagues. Do you think they're holding the Prime Minister to ransom? Yes. Uh, they, they're undermining her. Uh, I, I think they would seek to replace her if, were it not for two problems. One is that the vast majority of Conservative uh, MPs would uh, support her in a vote of confidence if one had to be held, which is why they haven't put any letters in to ask for a vote of confidence. Uh, and uh, the other thing is they can't agree amongst themselves uh, about which of them is the candidate to replace her if they did think they had any chance of winning. So they're all competing with each other to try to demonstrate by leaks and briefing and so on uh, that they are somehow the toughest and strongest of these people who are trying to undermine her. You once uh, famously called the Prime Minister a bloody difficult woman. Should she be a bit more difficult with her Brexiteers? Uh, yes, a bit. <laughs> I think she did. I agree with your paddle that she did see off David Davis in the discussions uh, last week about the backstop. But the, uh, I, I think uh, she ought to be, instead of putting it off for another month, a little bit more difficult, and I think the party should support her. I think Parliament, because Parliament on a cross-party basis, right. is really concerned about the long-term importance of all this. There is a parliamentary majority, may not be supported by Corbyn any more than Boris Johnson, but is in favour of actually giving the Prime Minister the authority to negotiate a sensible future for us. Ken Clark, thank you very much for that. Now we can speak to the Housing Minister, Dominic Grubb, who's here in the studio. Thank you very much for coming in. Uh, Ken Clark making his views on how he intends to vote and how he would like his colleagues to vote next week very clear. How worried are the government about losing any of these votes? I think we need to take very seriously all the different views, um, but I think we're reasonably confident. I was involved steering the withdrawal bill through at the Commons stage, and we won 57 out, out of 58 votes, and I'm reasonably confident that we'll get the legislation through. And, it, of course, let's remember why it's important, because whether you vote to leave or remain, we all want to avoid the legal cliff edge when we leave the EU, and we all want to we accept that we need to take back control of our laws. And those are the two strategic things this bill does, and I think we should all be able to unite behind that. Now, Amber Rudd and Ian Duncan Smith in their joint article this morning are trying to be helpful, urging their colleagues to vote with the government, but they also heavily imply that a government defeat could actually risk either Theresa May's premiership or the government's safety itself. Raising the stakes that high and saying the government's in genuine peril, is that helpful? Well, look, I think what it shows is you've got former, two former cabinet ministers on polar opposite sides 
of the EU campaign when we had the referendum, uniting and showing that the Conservative Party and indeed the country needs to be bigger than the sum of its parts. But are they right when they say oh, that if the government loses that it could fall? I think we, uh, people thinking about voting against the government this week need to think very uh, seriously about it. But the most important thing is that we get that legislation through because it avoids the legal cliff edge. It makes sure that we have a smooth legal transition in relation to Brexit and it sends the Prime Minister into the June Council with uh, the, the wind in her sails rather than um, you know, perhaps delaying the domestic process. But this is just kicking the can down the road, isn't it? Because what we're hearing quite clearly is even if you are able to keep some of your potential Remain rebels on side this week, when it comes to the amendment on the trade and customs bills, which are going to be debated before recess probably next month, you've got every chance of losing then. Well, we had votes on the customs union and the single market before at the common stage that I described to you. We won all of them. Um, but I don't think this is kicking the can down the road. Getting this legislation through will be a key turning point, I think, in the Brexit process because we'll have the laws in place to make sure we can have that smooth transition. But we do need to make further progress in the talks, and that's what the June Council will do, particularly on those key trade talks. So the government have offered one concession on the, the um, amendment about a meaningful vote, saying that they would come and make a statement to the House rather than offer a vote. Although it seems remarkable to imagine a situation where the government could have agreed a deal and wouldn't make a statement to the House about that. Can you offer anything more on that or offer potential rebels anything on the customs union to make them more likely to vote with the government? Well, we discussed what would happen at the committee stages that I described and, of course, there are going to be multiple votes and plenty of parliamentary scrutiny. It's not as if we haven't had enough debate or discussion. You and could offer some sweeteners now. Oh, well, it's not about sweeteners. It's about getting the legislation right in the best interests of the country. And the two things. One, if you want to seize the opportunities of Brexit, the EU withdrawal bill helps us to take back control over our laws but we also need to make sure it's smooth transition both for businesses but also for citizens up and down the country those are the two strategic aims of this bill so the whips cannot offer any further concessions in order to try and make sure that the government wins these votes well fortunately for me i'm not a whip so i'll leave it to them um, what was more destabilizing for the government this week do you think it was a rocky week but what was worse the row with david davis and the fraught negotiations over the temporary customs arrangement or the leak of boris johnson attacking theresa may's brexit strategy and saying it's all heading for meltdown well actually on the backstop of the david davis issue actually we've got some clarity around that and it's important because people want to see some finality to our uh, to, to the, the brexit negotiations and to make sure we put the new relationship on a sustainable footing there's no so finality we don't, and, to that no no but the backstop all. but the backstop allows even in the worst case scenario to have that but look the reality is we've had the din of noise and criticism of every step of the brexit process and actually it's always preceded a breakthrough in the negotiations on the first phase deal on the implementation period and I'm pretty confident we'll prove the doubt is wrong again. But let's look at what finality there is on the backstop. So what was agreed with David Davis was uh, that this would be a temporary customs arrangement that the government expects to end by the end of December 2021. Expects doesn't mean anything at all, does it? That's no kind of guarantee that we won't still be in a customs arrangement with the EU in 2022, 2023. What you said is not quite right, just as a matter of accuracy. What this says is that when we agree the withdrawal agre uh, agreement, which is de de deals with the separation issues, if we've made enough progress, as we expect and we're confident, on the trade talks, but we're not sure we'll have the, the time to put the technical domestic arrangements in place, this backstop allows us a bit more leeway, but with that finality. That's the point of it. But of course... But the how Prime do you Minister's know those arrangements will be ready by the end of 2021? Well, HMRC it, says it could take five years it, to put we, any of these arrangements we, in place. We, we don't know for sure. We're confident it can be done much quicker than 2021. We don't know for sure, but that's why you have a backstop. But it doesn't but guarantee the that the temporary customs arrangements will end by the end of 2021. There's no guarantee at all in it. We could easily be going into the next election in 2022 still tied to the European Union. No, that's wrong and we wouldn't be able to accept that arrangement. Politically, it would be utterly unacceptable, but there's nothing in what the government have published last week that says that we would definitely be... I, David Liddington, no, the sorry, Cabinet sorry, Secretary this morning, was saying it's a hope and it's an intention that the backstop would end by the end of 2021, but there's no guarantee about it. Oh, no, it. The, the backstop would end by December 2021, but the key thing is this is the worst-case scenario. We're confident that as we make progress with the trade talks, we'll be in a better position well before then. But it's right to make sure you're prepared for all eventualities. That's the responsible thing to do. How can you get... It's, so it's a backstop. It's there in the worst case scenario that you haven't come to another 
arrangement. You don't know that new customs arrangements will be ready by the end of 2021. So how can you guarantee that we will have left by 2020? Oh, I'm confident the customs arrangements will be in place. But I think the one thing which is uncertain until we go into the June summit and engage with the EU is precisely what the contours of the trade deal will look like. So in that sense, yes, it, it, we're trying to make sure we cater for all eventualities. And until we get down to the detail of the trade talks and the free trade agreement, we won't know for precisely what we're preparing for in terms of the end date. But let's also remember, through the Lancaster House speech, um, through the, uh, uh, the more recent speeches and detail and the position papers the government's put out, we're very clearly coming out of the customs union. What we want to make sure is there's no return to the hard border with Northern Ireland and we have as frictionless trade with the EU as possible. Those are the three things that we need to deliver and the question is which mechanism, which technical arrangement best serves those ends. Is the EU making too much of the Irish border issue? And Boris Johnson suggested that it's the tail being allowed to wag the dog and others have... have put forward the idea that they are using it as an excuse to try and keep the UK tied as closely as possible to the rest of the EU and that they're, they're making too much of the border issue. Well, I hope that's not the case, that they, the, the suggestion that you're um, uh, reflecting to me that they're doing it for political purposes, but we're reasonably confident. And you, well, that's what Boris and, suggested. And you, well, you, you quoted John uh, Thompson, the head of HMRC. He's, he said that under any circumstances, we will avoid any extra infrastructure at the border with Northern, Northern Ireland in any circumstance. So actually, that ought to give reassurance. Would Trump do a better job of the Brexit negotiations? He would certainly have a different style, as Boris Johnson described this week. Would it be effective, do you think? No, we've got the right Prime Minister leading us into this. It's you know, a historic juncture for this country, and I think we all need to hold our nerve. We have the din of criticism, I said. It's always preceded breakthroughs with the negotiations. And I think the Prime Minister um, is the right person with the right team lead leading us into the June summit. And actually, I'm pretty confident we're going to make progress, both on the legislation going through Parliament this week, but also on those trade talks. And if necessary, she'll be bloody difficult with Michelle Bar Barnier? I'm sure she will. Dominic Raff, thank you very much. Now, let's turn to Labour's position ahead of those big Brexit votes in the coming week. Here's the Shadow Brexit Secretary Keir Starmer, who was speaking to Andrew Marr a little earlier. The idea that this Tuesday or this Wednesday is the last chance saloon on a single market deal is misconceived. There will be another chance with those bills. I hope we get significant victories this week on the things that matter, which is the meaningful vote, the but customs union. Won't. Well, that will be the test. And I do urge right. Tory MPs who care about this. I know it's difficult um, to, to, to back those amendments. To, uh, uh, we will back those amendments. And if that happens, that will be a defining change this week. Well, we're joined now by two Labour MPs who take a rather different view of what should happen next week. Caroline Flint is a former Europe Minister and she's in Sheffield. Chris Leslie is here in the studio. He belongs to the campaign group Open Britain. Good morning to both right. of you. Thank you for coming to join us. Um, Chris Leslie, we heard Keir Starmer there laying out the Labour position. What's your problem with that? Well, my, my issue is that when you're in opposition, and we could be in opposition for very many years, you, you rarely get chances to shape events, serious events for the whole future of the country. But this coming week is one such chance because we know that there are a dozen, maybe several more, Conservative MPs who are willing to rebel and back this concept of the European economic area, the single market. Now, when we've got that within our grasp, I think, as a Labour uh, block of MPs, we would be completely foolish to miss the opportunity both to defeat the Prime Minister and, crucially, avoid a hard Brexit. Because avoiding that hard Brexit is the best, work, best thing we can do to protect the jobs and the prosperity of our constituents and, by the way, also protect the revenues we need for schools and hospitals and all those things, the austerity that is likely to hit in the decade ahead if we have such a hard Brexit. Caroline, you're giving up the opportunity to defeat the government. Well, it wouldn't be a defeat for the government. It's more like a defeat for the United Kingdom because the EEA option, the Norway option, is short of leaving without a deal, is the worst possible deal because effectively we will become second-class members of the EU where we have to accept all the rules, all the conditions, but with no votes and no say. And that would include accepting no change to freedom of movement. But the amendment Keir Starmer is putting forward that you agree with calls for shared institutions and full access to the single market. In many ways, it's not that different, really, is it, to EEA membership? What's, what's the sticking point for you? Well, it actually deletes uh, Lord Ali's amendment, which talks about joining the EEA. Uh, what it does talk about, which I do support, 
and actually the Labour position has been clear about this all along, is that we want to have as close a relationship to the single market as we can, that where it makes sense, like for example the European Aviation Safety Authority or the European Medicines Agency, that we should work to work, work with those institutions where it's in our interest. But Labour is very clear, the reason why we are not supporting membership of the single market is because we cannot accept that we will have no say over the issue of freedom of movement in the future. And that is the big sticking point here. And, and, and there, are major victory, there are a, major sorry, there sorry, are a majority of Labour MPs who recognise that the EEA Norway option is the worst option for the United Kingdom. I've got good news for Caroline because it turns out the EEA, the European Economic Area, which were partially in, of course, because the EU is part of that, does allow for flexibilities, more flexibility on uh, migration. There's this clause, Article 112, which can be invoked by members of the EEA, which has already in practice allowed more flexibility for some of those members on migration. It also it is not just about rule taking. There are rule shaping powers within the EEA as well. Norway's already had that influence over postal directives, been able to veto some of those things, and uh, the, you know, the house hasn't crashed down as a result. So I I think when some of my colleagues, including Caroline, look closely at this opportunity, so a goal has opened up here, we can save the, the prospect of uh, future austerity hitting our constituents, uh, which by the way we would end up sharing responsibility for if we let the hard Brexit take place, and we can begin to steer uh, the negotiating objectives of the government, this is really the, the chance to do that. If we wait too much longer, uh, the government's going to get too f forward into that negotiating process. So this is the golden opportunity. Caroline, EEA membership does allow you a certain amount of freedom on migration policy. Well, I, I'm pleased to inform Chris that I have looked closely at this. And the truth is, is that in 1994, when Norway had a vote and people chose not to join the EU, um, efforts were made to come up with some sort of answer. And for Liechtenstein, which has 37,000 people in its population, for Norway and Iceland, a total altogether of 6 million, an emergency break was allowed on immigration. And that was to deal particularly with Liechtenstein's situation, having a population of over 37,000. Now, it doesn't allow shaping on freedom of movement. And by that, I mean the ability for us as a country to have a visa system that allows us to look at what parts of our economy it would be good to have more migrants in and other parts of our economy and sectors where that is not the case. It is an emergency break provision that is temporary and has never been utilised by any of those countries that I've mentioned, Norway, Iceland or Liechtenstein. It is not an answer to the concerns of the British public over freedom of movement and it is not an answer to the concerns of the British public over being able to make the rules and where it suits our interests to work with our European partners in a strong way but where it doesn't we can go our own way. Chris, I just think we're at the 11th hour now and when we're in opposition what we have to do is look across the chamber where could there be a majority and can you imagine a circumstance where, uh, as Labour members of Parliament, where we care about the, the industries and manufacturing in our, in our patch? I mean, uh, very near to my constituency in the East Midlands, Toyota, big car manufacturing. I was there a couple of weeks ago, two and a half thousand work, workforce. They uh, don't have big warehouses. The trucks that come in for all the parts of those cars come in just in time. And if we don't have that uh, arrangement, if we don't have those frictionless borders, not only are we jeopardising the situation in Northern Ireland, but we're jeopardising serious jobs in our communities. I don't want that on my conscience. This is the opportunity we have to shape the future of Brexit. And if we fudge it, if we fluff that opportunity, uh, I don't think we can ever have the right to complain about the job losses or the cuts to come in the future. Caroline, please. Well, of course, People in your constituency, Chris, people in my constituency, since the global economic crash, have suffered from cuts, have suffered from stagnation in wages, have suffered from austerity, all whilst we've been in the European Union. Why make it and worse? I do not, I do not, I do not hesitate to uh, uh, admit that there are huge challenges ahead of us. But the problem is, is short of no deal, the EEA Norway option is the worst option because it doesn't allow us the ability to strike a bespoke deal that suits us but also a strong relation with the European Union. And I have to say, if Parliament this week supported the EEA option, well, quite frankly, 
the negotiations could be over in five minutes because Michael Barnier would bite the hand off the UK government to get that deal because they know that is the best deal for the EU and the worst deal for the UK. Well, that's, I and mean, there would be many Labour voters would feel very let down if freedom Absolutely. of movement continued, surely after uh, they had voted to leave no, the No, 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 the, the vast majority of Labour members, supporters, voters, all the polling shows, I think what poll this weekend, 75% of uh, Labour supporters want to stay in the single market because they know in their workplaces this this is going to matter. I'm I mean, Caroline, that... Caroline, you're is starting to sound a little bit like Jacob Rees-Mogg with the sort oh. of notion that we should almost go for Brexit at all costs. No, we have the opportunity here. We have the opportunity here to pick the best to possible option. Well, I think when you're losing the argument, you go to desperate accusations. I think we are caught in a situation, Sarah, between, quite frankly, hardline Brexiteers and hardline Remainers, many of whom want to overturn the referendum result. They're using mechanisms, they're using language, which really is seeking to undermine the outcome of that referendum. Right, I protect, campaigned for Remain. I campaigned for Remain in what was a leave seat. That's not an easy thing to do. I think the Remain campaign during the referendum made lots of mistakes because actually it was listening well, to some of the voices that we're currently hearing to let, support the EAA and overturn the let, referendum. Let, let, we'll, 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 have to, we'll have to leave it there. Thank you very much, both of you, for coming in to discuss that.